The time of myth is an era in the ancient past where gods, demons, and monsters roamed the earth. In medieval Europe, it was the Dark Ages, with historical rulers, dragons, dwarfs, and sometimes gods figuring in countless heroic epics and romances of coming out of Greek mythology. But I will not talk about dragons, demons, dwarfs, or, or monsters. We can still relate them to dragons, demons, dwarfs, and in the most violent ways, monsters. But first, I'd like to clarify the definition of time, the indefinite, continuous progress of existence in the past, present, and future taken as a whole. And what are myths? A traditional story or so, or so explaining the history of people or social phenomena. My life, to the very second of now, has been a series of myths accumulating to an era of dry existence. Never give up. Great things take time. Good times become good memories and bad times become bad memories. Time heals all scars. Why aren't you crying? It's better to cry. Reflect. In denial as usual. Desensitized, are you? Would you ever have a long life that's not eventful or a short life that's eventful? Time has wonderful ways of showing us what matters. It gets better by time. But are you immune? Words to live by, aren't they? Epics of the century. The certainty in every word was as palpable as it was destructive to me. If you'd have asked me in the summer of grade seven what I feared most, I would have told you time. That thing, that individual that has the power to control me and my actions, how dare it have the audacity to make me grieve over the value of having a short life in comparison to having a long one? How can it be so infallible that it has power over my now, then, and when? That powerful supremacy that I can only imagine, but time, no, it's not imaginable, is it? Time, my worst enemy, my indefinite one, at least until my death. And then there is death, such a taboo, if I asked my eight-year-old sister to find it, she'd probably tell me something along the line of going to heaven. My sister was also into the patron of death. She didn't cry a single irredeemable tear when it happened. She was only three. But my theory is that she will grieve, but only when she's satisfied the true understanding of what it is to lose someone, or if she's one of the unlucky majority that experienced it again. So is it possible that it doesn't get better by time? That this holy, unparalleled, unexceptional rule can get broken by an eight-year-old in the indefinite, progressive future? When she does realize the difference between losing someone or not having them around every day, will she grieve? Which brings us to our first myth. Gets better by time. I'm not saying it doesn't get better, or maybe I am, but it's not a matter of time, it's a matter of understanding. When I was 11 or 10, I don't really remember, I was chased or rather followed down a dark road by a random individual. The elevator was broken and the stairs were obscured with darkness. My heart was diluted with the feeling, much more scarce. One that's a mixture between coldness and warmth, one that I can feel all through my body, across my floral dress. Something worse than fear. I still get that feeling to this very day. It overwhelms my body. Whenever I get it, I imagine myself walking through that obscured hallway, getting brushed with those feelings. I can feel myself now. Imagining this I speak and getting brushed with those feelings, I hope it doesn't overwhelm me. I gave you an exact description of a traumatic event, where I was, what I was wearing. I can tell you how he looked, but I prefer not to. And all I couldn't remember was my age. I don't remember how long it's been. I don't care enough to, because I still remember it as if it was yesterday. And I applaud all those that are able to forget such traumatic events by time, but time does not heal all scars. Which is our second myth. I like to speak to the person who has lived forever and decided that time heals all scars. I mean, time is indefinite, right? Which means that it continues even after the you die. And who is the person that decided that time heals all scars based on his indefinite life? Before you think that I'm trying to say that life's full of scars and that you'll always be scarred and that life's an oblivious void of disappointment and constant agony, I'd like you all to look at your watches. If we can unify this area only based on time, we could unify it to a time of plus or minus a second. If you can unify the entire city, it'd be plus or minus a couple seconds. The entire country would be plus or minus a couple of minutes. The entire Middle East would be plus or minus a couple of hours. The entire world would be plus or minus a couple of days. And then the entire universe would have an infinite uncertainty in time. So why is it that we base all our words to live by on something we aren't even certain of? We say with such certainty, forgetting the actual so-called fact of time in itself is uncertain. And as Einstein put it, it's an illusion. Basing feelings are in itself particular to us as individuals. I mean, despite the obvious fact that these rules are socially constructed, sorry, I mean individually constructed, they are based on the assumption that time affects us all equally, even though in this very room I've proven to you that there's an uncertainty in it, even if it's just a couple of seconds. But we still 
still choose to measure. Measure our own lives even while we're at it. A scientist once said that we turn into quantities when we can't compare the qualities of things. And because we can't compare the qualities of life, we decided to miss that we can be measured. Based on how long or short our lives are, 15 year olds, 50 year olds, 16 year olds, 60 year olds, as if we're all just numbers. When we went to retirement home, there was a woman there that had lost her husband 15 or 10 years ago. Her brothers and sisters also have died, and despite the fact that she had money, she decided to stay there. And she said that she was waiting, waiting to die. Now, someone like her probably would have preferred to die 15 years ago and there was actually someone there to mourn her, but because she had a long life, she's been denied that sentiment. But no, we should mourn someone that has a short life for the quantified value that is their life. I mean, this isn't just degrading to the person who decides to mourn less for the misconception that having a long life is fulfilling. This is degrading to the person that we decided to only mourn for the quantified value that determines that his life is short, mourning him on his age was determined by the body rather than the metaphorical value determined by the soul, the dying of any metaphorical or sentimental value anyone else, anyone else might care about. Now that woman probably would have preferred to die when she was younger. And if she did, maybe she would have preferred to die when she was older. But she doesn't know what death is and neither do we. And no one has ever died and came back to tell us that their life was long or short or whatever they preferred it to be. And I know that we are all infinities, but some infinities are bigger than others. And I don't know which infinity I am, so how do you know which infinity you are? <laughs> but we still choose to measure. Measure our emotional progressions even while we're at it. So why is it that we measure our emotional progression on the same scale that time is measured on? So in light of that, my fourth myth, desensitization. Someone very close to me lost their mother and sister in a crash. That wasn't traumatic enough. That person was actually inside the crash when it happened. Her father wasn't around afterwards, and she ended up living with her grandmother. She's one of the strongest people I know. I wouldn't dare let anyone say she's desensitized. She's used to it. We say it gets better by time, and then when it does, we become called immune. Yes, I say we, because I went through something similar. I lost someone when I was in grade seven, and that very close person to me was the first person to see me after it happened and before I knew it did, and she held her tears in front of me. I never understood this emotional maturity that I was put in that position. And even then, when I was put in a room with 20 individuals crying and one was cried in my own arms and I had to calm them down despite the fact that I wasn't crying, they were still asking me why I wasn't. Oh, I was probably in denial, as if denial is some type of drug victims of trauma take, because no, it's only been two days, how can she be fine? She's probably holding all that pain in and waiting for that right, amazing question to be asked so she can let out all that pain in the form of satisfaction for all the individuals in the room. And no, I wasn't in denial. I just cried for two continuous days without eating or drinking, so I literally, physically can't cry for you. This is called stage grief. In my cases that I had to cry in order to ironically show that I'm grieving and hence that I'm fine, I know others are actually forced to hold it in because crying shows weakness and hence they have to hold in their grief for the satisfaction of the others in the room. But no, I shouldn't be appealing to criteria created by someone who told me it was haram to cry at night because the devil would come to you as if the devil even left my side, trust me. The devil's already inside me, but no, I should cry in the daytime as if my pain can be controlled to incline your satisfaction for my stage grief. And still, so, time went by, and two months later they forced me to confide against my own volition because they were sure I'm not fine. And then five years later, here we are, and they're still forcing me to confide because they're still sure that I'm not fine. That's funny, because I thought it gets better by time, so then why are you so sure that I'm not fine? Those who do believe in fine, think of desensitization. But desensitization defined by psychology as free someone from a neurosis or phobia by gradually exposing them to the thing that is feared most. And no, I certainly am not free. I went home and cried that night through music because the only way I can understand. But that's just me. We all have our particular way of grieving and no time and exposure does not make me or anyone else desensitized. Do not apply your general way of grieving to anyone if you cry. Despite the fact that you're not even slightly involved, it's okay. It's a dispensive emotion and salty secretions of liquid from your body. It does not mean the same to you as it does to everyone else. And if you don't cry, that's not abnormal. What's abnormal is the social phenomena that is the romanticizing of scars and death by relating them to criteria. I love you! <laughs> I told you that my worst enemy is time. Yes, it is the monster I was referring to and those desensitized are the warriors. But that's when I was only 12. I realized by experience and not time that it isn't. 
time to not take away the closest person to me, time to not make me desensitize, and time certainly to not tell anyone else to believe so. We gave it the power to do so by creating all these myths that we use as golden rules, forgetting that there are so many exclusions to the rule to the point that they have become exceptions to themselves. We should come to the realization that not only is our way of grieving in itself particular to us as agencies, but the basis of time itself is uncertain, time being the indefinite, continued progress of existence in the past, present, and future. Taken as a whole, which means that it's indefinite, progressive, not incentive, and in contrary with this definition I have shown you, it cannot be taken as a whole without uncertainty. So let's not put a basis to our emotions and just grieve or not grieve. I mean, in the end, you're the only person who knows whether you're fine or not. Those who believe in these myths are not wrong, not in my perspective at least. They're just in no position of putting these words in someone else's mouth. So if I die now, I don't want people to say that I died now. I want them to say that I died here. Because for me, time is a hopeful reassurance that turned into the classification of lives into quantities for the wrong conclusion that we grieve in the exact same way, no matter how long it takes. And trust me, if that's what you're waiting for, then feel free to wait forever because how long it takes is external of you. And it will leave you to believe, as a famous poet once said, how did it get so late so soon? I told you the time of myths and air in the ancient past where gods, demons, and monsters roamed the earth. I hope it sounds familiar now, because in light of that, welcome to the recreation of the time of myths, or in our case, commonly known as the myth of time itself. <laughs>